Ah, South Carolina, the northernmost state with abundant palm trees, subtropical beaches packed with tourists in the summertime, and who could forget college football? It was the first state to secede from the Union in 1860, which sparked the Civil War. Even as an ardent supporter of the Union, I can't but help admire and have respect for the state's rebel edge. However, even as the state remains one of the more conservative states in the Union, one look at the elected officials and you will see that that rebel edge has all but vanished. It's not necessarily that the voters themselves are averse to nationalist, populist, authentically conservative candidates. They are no Utah. Albeit even a portion of Utah's leftward lurch recently could be attributed to Trump's personal life and loyalty to establishmentarian Mormon politicians more than an aversion to true America first policy. South Carolina gave Trump a commanding 10 point victory in the crowded 2016 primary, one which arguably gave him the boost he needed to legitimize his campaign from that point forward and made little Jeb drop out of the race. Trump did better than Romney in that state both times as well to boot, running up the margins even more than past Republicans in the Appalachian white working class part of the state. Yet the party at the state level hasn't taken note of this surge and is hell bent on being one of the most broken, cucked, and neoconservative state GOPs in the entire nation. So how did we get here? I'm not sure there's an exact date for the South Carolina GOP of old becoming the South Carolina of new, but I think it's fair to assume this downfall started sometime in the early 2000s, more specifically 2002. Senator Strom Thurmond, the controversial conservative firebrand who was over 100 years old at the time, decided to retire from the Senate. Thurmond started off in the Senate as a Dixiecrat, yet was the only senator to switch parties in protest of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Thurmond moderated his stances on race over time, although typically avoided the topic altogether after the 60s. He ironically won a fairly large share of the black vote in his election as well, receiving levels Republicans typically haven't seen since before the 1960s. Thurman's legacy in his later years focused on promoting a strong sense of social and fiscal conservatism, and while he wasn't perfect given his support for the Brady Bill and a moderate level of overseas intervention, he was much better than those who came after. I think it's probably best we do this video in parts, talking about the failures of the GOP at the Senate, Congressional, and state levels, respectively, and touching on the party apparatus towards the end. And of course, starting at the Senate level, there has arguably been no larger inhibitor to true conservative change in this country in recent years than the man who ended up replacing Thurmond, a man who goes by the name of Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham has been a part of the GOP establishment his entire career. Originally viewed as a rising star in Congress due to his role in the Clinton impeachment hearings, he was elected to the Senate in 2002 and instantly became one of the more neoconservative senators, being an ardent supporter of the Iraq War. Ironically enough, in 2008, Graham was challenged by a Trumpian America First Democrat pilot named Bob Conley, who made his campaign against Graham centered around fair trade, ending mass immigration, and opposing the Iraq War. He supported protecting American workers, opposed gay marriage, supported repealing the Patriot Act, and ending Wall Street bailouts. The guy was most certainly in the wrong party, but either way, he was far ahead of his time politically. He lost by 15 points in the end, but in retrospect, he should have won and switched parties. Maybe then the South Carolina GOP would not be as broken as it is now, but that didn't happen. Graham was widely known as a neocon for his first 14 years in the Senate, even before Trump came along. Not only was he one of the most McCain-style, ardent defenders of regime change, siding with Bush on the Iraq War and Obama on Libya, he was also horrendous on the issue of immigration, being a part of the Gang of Eight, which if passed, would have given illegal aliens blanket amnesty and increased work visas significantly. Numbers USA usually gave Graham a D or an F on the issue for most Congresses, with his career average sitting at a lowly C-, worse than even a good chunk of Democrats. Downright awful. Not to mention his Obama-like support for ridiculous climate change measures, and the fact that he was a jab mandate shill, 
years before it was cool. Oh, not to mention the fact that he also supported red flag laws too. He was so liberal on social issues that even the Club for Growth said that in 2014, they would support a primary challenger to him. However, that challenge never materialized. Graham actually ran for president in 2016, believe it or not, yet naturally his run did not go anywhere and he dropped out before Christmas of 2015. However, he became notable during that cycle for his criticism of Donald Trump. Shortly after Trump announced his presidential run, Graham called Trump a jackass as the two leaked each other's personal phone numbers. He later stated that Trump was a xenophobe, racist, and religious bigot, echoing the left's ridiculous attack lines on him. He even went so far as to say he would rather lose without Trump than try to win with him and told him to go to hell. He called him a kook, crazy, and unfit for office, and he voted for Evan McMullen in the 2016 election. However, shortly after Trump took office, like many other members of the GOP establishment, Graham changed his tune and also his strategy. Graham's criticism of Trump dissipated throughout 2017 as the two played golf together. Presumably, Graham was wise enough not to get on Trump's bad side, such as other never-Trumpers like Bob Corker or Jeff Flake, both of whom would have been at risk of losing their primaries had they decided not to retire. And although it flew under the radar at the time, he literally admitted he only supported Trump to stay relevant and to help his Senate run. Really. Graham was basically forgiven by the Republican base by the time he stood up for then-Judge Brett Kavanaugh during the 2018 witch hunt hearings, and he instantly became a prominent supporter of Trump in the Senate. But given how the whole Kavanaugh tenure has turned out to be so far, it's evident that this whole thing was just one big psyop. Lindsey Graham definitely used his newfound forgiveness and proximity to Trump to help steer his administration away from its original intentions. On foreign policy, there was nobody who wanted Trump to intervene in Iran more than Lindsey Graham. Thankfully, we avoided World War III because Tucker Carlson kept Trump in check on the issue. Graham is also allegedly a key power player when it comes to Trump endorsements and is usually present at Mar-a-Lago before Trump endorses an insufficiently conservative, primaryable senator who could be replaced with an America First fighter if Trump did not endorse them. Senators like Arkansas's John Boozman, Idaho's Mike Crapo, and South Carolina's other senator Tim Scott. Thankfully, Graham is seemingly less present in Trump's inner circle Trump publicly distancing himself from the senator in September, so one could hope that in a second Trump term, things may go more smoothly on that front. Sadly, Graham himself is not up for re-election until 2026, and by then, he may retire, or at least be primaried out for real this time. Speaking of Tim Scott, South Carolina's other senator is not much better than his rumored boyfriend, Lindsey. In fact, in many ways, he arguably may be worse. Taking over from the last good senator of the state, Jim DeMint, Scott was appointed to the Senate by Governor Nikki Haley, what a shocker, in 2012, winning re-election to the rest of the term in 2014 and re-election to his first full term in 2016. Scott is not exactly as bad as Graham on most issues. He's less interventionist on foreign policy as he opposed intervening in Libya, yet he still supports intervention in Iran and Afghanistan, which puts him on the neoconservative side of things on that front overall. Scott is also a staunch opponent of amnesty, earning a career A-plus from Numbers USA on immigration. However, besides some remedial economic stuff, the positives of Tim Scott stop there. Scott's signature issues are race relations and law and order. Scott prides himself on being the only black Republican elected to the US Senate and the first since Reconstruction. However, instead of using that aspect of his identity and platform to be a voice against the Marxist, anti-white BLM movement, he not only buys their lies, but often promotes them under the guise of conservatism. After every single police shooting of an unarmed black male, almost all of which end up being sensationalized by the media before turning out to be justified when the facts are available, Tim Scott is never on the side of wait for the facts, yet always on the side of claiming racism. He routinely talks just like a leftist politician about police matters, and at least on this issue, he is one. Tim Scott jumped the gun in regards to George Floyd, Jacob Blake, and many other black men who died at the hands of police 
only for the base to find out soon after the events were reported that the actions were 100% justified. Scott did not overreact this way in regards to white people being killed by police, nor has he even said a word about Kyle Rittenhouse, a white teen from suburban Chicago who nearly spent his life in prison for defending himself from the Marxist BLM mob. Scott clearly has a vested interest in caving into the mob's narrative, despite the fact that it's been debunked by nearly every fact in existence, which puts him at odds with Trump's base. So much so to the point where he's been hyper-focused on leftist police reform measures, especially at a time where crime has gone to levels we haven't seen in decades. Being tough on crime is what we need. Conservatives have been psyop by the establishment into trying to own Brandon by invoking his support for the 94 crime bill, while ignoring the fact that it objectively did far more good than harm, especially in reducing crime. Yet Tim Scott disagrees. Scott also was not a big fan of Donald Trump early on, and was a vocal opponent of him throughout the 2016 presidential primaries. Like Graham, he only became a fan after he could persuade him into buying his ridiculous agenda. Scott criticized Trump after his factually correct remarks after the Charlottesville incident, in which he blamed Antifa and Wignats alike for causing the ruckus, yet also noted the fact that some people who were not a part of either group were there to protest the statue removal, a fact backed up by the New York Times. Scott then had a talk with Trump and his rhetoric softened on the manner. Scott's SJW level BLM support came back into light in 2020 in wake of the George Floyd riots as he released a joint statement with Karen Bass of all people to condemn what took place as a racist murder devoid of all facts regarding the situation. Scott also then criticized Trump shortly after, after Trump condemned the Floyd riots, telling them that they would face severe consequences for looting. Then he had a chat with him and made sure that Trump was focused more on caving into the mob that hates him instead of putting out the riots. Scott also made sure that Trump's re-election bid was hyper-focused on pandering to black voters, which the returns were minimal, as Trump received about 10% of the black voters so instead of the 8% he received in 2016. If Trump dedicated half of that energy on working class Americans as a whole, mainly white working class Americans in the Midwest who are more electorally malleable, he likely would have won. I don't understand this notion that we need to be hyper-focused on increasing our vote share with 12% of the electorate who have been unwavering in Democrat support instead of focusing on the 42% of the electorate who has been malleable and have given Republicans close to 70% support. Doing the latter would probably net the GOP more black votes in the process by proxy, as black voters who are interested in trying something new will likely gravitate towards authenticity instead of a castrated right wing that tries to unsuccessfully outwoke the left. Pandering doesn't work to build the tent. Scott received less than 10% of the black vote in both of his elections so far, and likely will not improve much on that in 2022 but that doesn't prevent him from pandering as much as possible. And notice how, if you criticize Scott over legitimate things, or even fathom bringing up the idea that he should be primaried out, his defenders resort to the same cheap Marxist tactic as many on the left did for many years if you were to critique Obama, call you racist so you fall in line. The good news is that Tim Scott is up for re-election this fall and has a primary challenger, a grassroots candidate by the name of Tim Swain, an actual America First conservative who wants an immigration moratorium, big tech accountability, and is solid on all other key issues. The bad news is that Trump has already endorsed Scott, Scott has a large fundraising advantage, and too much of the electorate will fall for the notion of it being bad optics that the only black senator on the right would be primaried out. This comes despite the fact that pretty much all of these primary voters would easily support Herschel Walker or Mark Robinson if they lived one state to the south or one state to the north. One could hope that Swain has a respectable showing and uses it as a springboard to run for Congress in 2024, which may actually help get some decent Republicans in power in South Carolina. Speaking of Congress, the representatives in South Carolina, hint, aren't much better than their senators. All districts in the state are R plus 7 or above, so one would think that you could at least have a solid delegation, but honestly, that's where you would be wrong. And this doesn't even count the horrendous past congressmen of the state who are no longer serving, such as horrendous Trump chief of staff and potential leaker Mick Mulvaney, 
who was replaced by a much better congressman from the better Carolina, former Governor Mark Sanford, who we'll get to later, Tim Scott and Lindsey Graham themselves, ardent never Trumper Bob Inglis, and on and off MAGA Inc. grifter Trey Gowdy. Now, I will say there are some decent or almost solid Republican congressmen from the state. There's Jeff Duncan, who supported Trump's decision to withdraw from Syria and supported restricting legal immigration. There's also Rolf Norman, who voted to keep Steve King on his committee after the media witch hunt against him, opposes endless wars, supports ending the visa lottery and limiting legal immigration, voted against giving the 1-6 police a congressional medal, and was one of only a handful of House Republicans who voted against making Juneteenth a national holiday. The good really stops there, and I will have to say that I wish that Duncan and Norman would use their influence in Congress to attempt to push back on Graham and Scott, if not have tried to primary them, as it could take the South Carolina GOP in a better direction, but that hasn't materialized. Up next, we have William Timmons and Joe Wilson. Both of them are extremely average, run-of-the-mill Normicons. Both objected to the results of 2020, as did Duncan and Norman, but likely only did so to save face in their districts. The only thing Wilson really is known for was shouting, you lie, at Obama during the State of the Union that one time. It's not true. Which he caved in and apologized for soon after. They love foreign intervention and hate online poker. And they also voted to rename military bases to appease the mob. Honestly, we could really do without them. Up next on the list is Tom Rice, one of the infamous impeachment 10. Rice is so abysmal that he voted to impeach Trump for something he did not even do after he voted to object to the 2020 results. If the 2016 Falcons were a Republican congressman, it would be this guy. His tenure outside of the Trump stuff is also abysmal. He voted to put his own voter base at risk by voting to establish the 1-6 Commission, which we all know will be utilized to increase surveillance on everyday Trump supporters. The good news is that he has several primary challengers, all of which are better than him, and that Trump will almost certainly endorse his challenger, replacing him as soon as we can. Rice may be better on the issues than one may expect when you look past his support for impeachment, but still, we can use this as an opportunity to get somebody much better in there. Now Rice, as awful as he is, is not even close to the worst representative from the state, which is truly saying something. The worst representative in the state isn't even a member of the impeachment 10, although given her rhetoric and incompetence, she might as well be. And you guessed it, we're talking about none other than Nancy Mace. Many on the right had high hopes for Nancy Mace, especially as she ran on a pro-Trump platform, tying herself to him in the primary extensively in advertisements. Trump then endorsed her in the general election and carried her across the finish line by a few points in a swing seat which was at the time held by Democrat Joe Cunningham. Many had promised for Mace, however it did not take long for Mace's stock to fall in the gutter. One of Mace's first votes in Congress was to certify the 2020 election, which in and of itself did not get headlines. However, shortly after January 6th, she appeared on MSNBC to trash the president, using leftist rhetoric to take a subtle swipe at his movement. She said she did not vote for impeachment only because the process was too rushed, and claimed erroneously that Trump, not McConnell and the GOP establishment, were the reason why the Republicans lost the Senate. She ran on Trump's name when it was convenient to her, only to stab him in the back and her entire voting base in the back as well for a few brownie points over at MSNBC. A true charlatan to say the least. Let's look at her record. Mace has routinely been a jab enthusiast, so much so that she tweeted about how excited she was to get one so she could go back to licking doorknobs. I don't know if that's supposed to be funny or whatever, but that's not how a respectable individual in Congress would carry themselves. But hey, when you're a woman, you can get away with anything, right? Mace has consistently punched right at authentically conservative representatives like Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene, insinuating that they were racist for advocating for traditional architecture with the America First Caucus. She also has been a consistent supporter of BLM ideals, jumping the gun to promote their narrative even faster than Tim Scott every single time a police shooting takes place. She falsely claimed that Dante Wright in Minnesota was pulled over for having an air freshener in his car, 
when it actually was because he had felony warrants and an expired tag. She also constantly promoted the lie that George Floyd was hunted down in cold blood and murdered because he was black, even claiming that a criminal degree of racism runs rampant through our criminal justice system. Yet it's not like Nancy Mace actually cares about the rule of law or the sanctity of a fair justice system when it comes to Trump supporters as she voted to hold Steve Bannon in contempt of Congress for doing virtually nothing. Mace also opposed removing warmongering neocon Liz Cheney from her committee chair, claiming that those who wished to do so were QAnon-level conspiracy theorists. Mace then subsequently did fundraisers with Cheney, but when it turned out that Cheney would be replaced by true centrist Elise Stefanik, Mace voted to remove her, calling her too divisive for the position. Mace's policy shortcomings don't stop there. She voted to draft women, supports gay marriage, and supports legalizing marijuana and regulating it as alcohol. So, what is Mace actually conserving? When you ignore the fact that she supports lowering taxes, how is she indistinguishable from your average Democrat even? She's not, and she never has been. She's a degenerate, BLM-loving feminist who has arguably more in common with Kamala Harris than she does Donald Trump. And even though she grifted off of Trump's name to win her primary, her tenure as a leader in the state party and in the state delegation before Congress was no better. Mace voted against expanding offshore drilling measures in the state, hurting the state's economy in the process. The conservationist voters of South Carolina, a far-left environmentalist group, gave her a 100% rating for her tenure. Mace only voted for abortion restriction measures after she fought very hard for exception clauses in the state legislature. This pro-choice tendency has carried over since to Congress, as she has supported expanding birth control and indicating that she would not commit to overturning Roe v. Wade. Not only are Mace's political views awful, but the way she conducts herself, both privately and publicly, is even more telling of her lack of character. And this goes far beyond the doorknob licking incident. Mace also has posted bizarre videos of her eating Twinkies at 6 a.m. as if that makes her relatable to her constituents or something. And back when she was a state representative, and while she was married nonetheless, she did something so disgraceful that I have to preface it by saying that if you're easily grossed out, you should probably look the other way. So yes, on video, we have Nancy Mace kissing another woman while she was married, spitting alcohol into her mouth, who does the same thing to another man, who does the same thing to another woman, as he throws up all over the place. All of these people are speculated to be involved in the South Carolina GOP. Yeah, real conservative leadership we have here. What a train wreck. The bottom line is that Mace is awful, she's not conservative, and an even worse grifter than the other establishment clowns in the state delegation. So we have no good senators, a couple solid representatives overshadowed by some train wrecks, so what about the governor situation? I will admit that the current governor, Henry McMaster, is relatively decent compared to other politicians in the state, but even then, he's nothing special and wasn't even initially elected. We'll get to Nikki Haley momentarily, but let's not forget that former governor-turned-representative Mark Sanford led the state before her tenure. The same guy who handpicked Haley as his successor, then subsequently went missing for a week, only to be found having an extramarital affair with a 43-year-old single mom in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He then ran for Congress in 2013 during a special election in which he was proudly endorsed by pornographers who cited bravery for cheating on his wife. No, seriously, this is conservatism at its finest right here. Sanford was called out by Trump for being unhelpful to his agenda, and Trump successfully primaried him out in 2018 via a single tweet, something I wish he did more to weak establishment representatives during his presidency. His challenger lost her election in that district, which is currently held by Mace. Sanford then challenged Trump for the Republican nomination in 2020, a campaign which he suspended months before the first primaries. Another total train wreck, to say the least. Post Sanford came Haley. Nikki Haley has to be one of the biggest snakes in the garden of politics, and most people seem to understand this now. I was proud to be ahead of the curve on this one, just as I have with Christy Noam of South Dakota and I probably would spend a lot more time on Haley than I am in this video if the base wasn't fully aware of how awful she truly is, but I felt obligated to touch on the highlights of her antics anyways for those not fully in the know. 
Haley was elected governor of South Carolina in 2010, barely. She only won by five points over a Democrat who was not necessarily a moderate in a year where the national environment was more Republican favorable than 1994. You heard that correctly. South Carolina voted to the left of the national environment in this race. She won re-election in a lower turnout rematch by a more respectable 14 point margin in 2014, but things went downhill from there. After the horrific terror attack at a black church in Charleston, Haley decided to join in with the left's politicization of the tragedy by removing the Confederate flag from the state grounds. Now, I'm not a supporter of the Confederacy, but it's pretty evident that right-wingers caving on flags and statues has led us down a slippery slope that's seen the left feel the need to tear down statues of George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, and even Abraham Lincoln himself. Not to mention that that flag is not even the actual Confederate flag from the 1860s, or the fact that most black Americans did not oppose the flag at significant rates until recently, mainly thanks to media framing. I mean, there was literally a time not too long ago when rappers would proudly wear that flag as a fashion symbol of Southern pride, but no, even the so-called conservatives have to fall for the scam. Haley also opposed signing a transgender bathroom bill in the state, allowing grown men into the same bathroom with little girls if they so please. I mean, I know that Trump himself was weak on this issue, but it's ridiculous how little the mainstream right, while in power, is willing to do to uphold traditional values and keep society safe. Haley was an awful governor, so much so to the point where nearly half the bills she vetoed were overridden in the state legislature. At the presidential level, only the disgraced, low IQ Andrew Johnson had a higher percentage of his vetoes overturned. Thankfully, Haley was replaced by McMaster. However, she didn't deserve the job she left her office for in the slightest. Haley was a pure never Trumper in 2016. She supported Rubio, insinuated Trump was racist, and lied about him not disavowing David Duke. Even after Trump won the nomination, she said she would vote for him, but was not a fan. However, after Trump won, he picked her to be the UN ambassador. And honestly, taking her out of Charleston may have been a good move if she was like going to leave the small business administration or something, but he put her in the worst place possible. Haley was definitely one of the more interventionist members of the Trump administration. She advocated for unnecessary sanctions on Russia, helped escalate tensions with North Korea, stoked tensions with Iran, and backed Trump's decision to strike Syria, unsubstantially chastising Assad in the process. And as the meme goes, she didn't last very long in that role. Besides her neoconservative tendencies and caving on cultural issues, she is also particularly weak on the issue of immigration. On the Ben Shapiro show in 2019, Haley claimed that America needs mass migration to enrich our culture, basically spitting in the faces of her voter base in South Carolina by indirectly claiming that they aren't good enough for her. Absolutely disgusting. America, immigrants are the fabric of America. It's what makes us great. It's, we need as many immigrants as we can. We need the skills, we need the talent, we need the culture. More recently, Haley has come under fire from the right for her Trump flip-flopping. On one network, she'll criticize him. On the other network, she'll praise him. She said Trump's post-election handling was not as fine as Stour and that Trump has led us down a dark path, but rejected his second impeachment, calling it politicized and hypocritical to Biden's call for unity. She is clearly walking a political tightrope in hopes that if she does run for president one day, she could win a primary by garnering both establishment support and vying for a Trump endorsement as well. But I don't think the GOP voter base is dumb enough for her to be successful in any meaningful regard. Haley is a globalist, a neoconservative, a pushover, who is apathetic to the issues that truly matter. Just like Sanford, Graham, Scott, Mace, Rice, Wilson, Timmons, and nearly just about everybody else in the South Carolina GOP are in some capacity. And it makes sense, given the fact that the party apparatus has no strong leadership. Their chairman, Drew McKissick, won his third term as chair in 2021. McKissick is a rank-and-file empty suit who is out of touch with the base so much so that county parties censure him on a regular basis. But honestly, there was no serious replacement to him offered. The only opposition he had was from none other than Lynn Wood, a Q boomer and lunatic who thinks Trump won California, raised money for Kyle Rittenhouse then withheld it, thinks Nick and Alex Jones are controlled opposition feds, and whose 2020 lawsuits were so outlandish 
that they likely discredited any reasonable lawsuit the Trump team put forward to challenge what took place. He also told voters to boycott the Georgia runoffs, not to punish the GOP establishment, but instead because David Perdue would be thrown in jail and replaced if they did, which literally makes no sense and sounds like something a mental patient would come up with. With Wood running the party, who knows what mess they would be in, but that doesn't mean we should settle with McKissick either. The best thing we can hope for is to primary Scott, as well as every representative except Duncan and Norman in 2022, then censure McKissick enough to the point where the more based and competent county parties have more leverage. And we should also try to do our best to find a great challenger to Lindsey Graham when he is up for re-election in 2026. Also, avoiding Nikki Haley at all costs when she ever tries to run for president is also a must. The stay with the rebel edge may have lost it, but it doesn't mean they can't get it back. Trump and his movement have shown conservatives how to fight. It's up for us to build on that and to fight back harder, especially in solid red states with weak Republican parties. If we can turn around South Carolina, let it be known that every state party in the nation and the national party will follow. We can look to none other than the South Carolina state motto, Dum Spiro Sparrow for guidance, Latin for while I breathe, I hope. And if we can keep moving and stay alive and determined, there is hope that we can turn the ship around once and for all. And that's my take. Thanks for watching this video. I plan on doing more documentary style videos like this pretty soon. One on the 2022 races in Arizona and one for Ohio. If you have any suggestions, comment them down below. Like for more videos like this, subscribe if you haven't yet, and hit the bell for notifications so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media, the links are all in the description down below. As always guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.